Just then, go back to you in a seat. Okay, that's not good. I'll let you continue.
Good morning. You're all very welcome to our morning service. While you're watching online or viewing the CD later, you're very welcome. And if there are any visitors here this morning, you are especially welcome. Let's say together the uh, words on the screen. (laughs) Technical error. They can be found on uh, Psalm 66, verses 1 and 2. Shout for the joy of God. All the earth sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Our first uh, praise this morning is uh, hymn 165, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. Good morning. morning. Let me bid you a warm welcome to church as we worship God together. Let's do that with our prayers of adoration and confession now. Let's pray. Our great God and our heavenly Father, we gather here this morning to shout for joy for all the things that you have done for us and for the God that you are to us. We sing and we pray and we preach today the glory of your name, giving all glorious praise to you. Lord, we do so because you're entirely worthy of praise. The whole earth is made to bring glory and worship to you for who else or what else could be worthy of it. Lord, we come today to praise you because of the great and glorious deeds you have done in the past. You turned the sea to dry land. Your people walked through the river on foot throughout 
the story of your word, Lord. We see these great and glorious things you've done for your people. Uh, But most of all, Lord, we praise you for the great deed of the gospel, for Jesus Christ, Son of God, second person of the Trinity, becoming incarnate, becoming fully man, living a righteous life on our behalf, dying an unjust death on the cross that was meant for us, all that we could be adopted as your sons and daughters. And Lord, it is that gospel, it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we gather to worship you today as our heavenly Father. Lord, we confess we are not always faithful worshipers and our hearts were often prone to putting ourselves and our own priorities and our own wants and desires ahead of yours. We are not always faithful and loving children as we ought to be considering all the things that you've done for us. And so, Lord, the burnt offering that we offer this morning is it's no animal, it's no physical sacrifice, Lord, but what we bring to you and what you accept are our contrite hearts. We bring our confession and we acknowledge that we're not who we ought to be. But we thank you in Christ that we can also come with assurance that we are still your children, that we can know your forgiveness, and that with the help of your Holy Spirit, we can become day by day the people and the worshipers that you've made us to be. So Lord, with the help of your Holy Spirit, would you open up our hearts and minds and ears to hear your word, to love it, and to learn to obey it, to live as faithful worshipers. Lord, help us not to cherish iniquity in our hearts, but to store up your word that it would be a light on the path of life ahead of us. Lord, bless and accept our service of worship this morning. We pray these things through the name of our mediator and our redeemer, Jesus Christ. And we give and we pray and we praise all glory to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning and ever shall be. Amen. Thanks, Sam. And now let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. Verses 1 to 6 we're reading today. It's found on page 637 in the Pew Bibles. And let us take a moment to turn there. Excuse me. Well, let us uh, now come to hear from God's Word what is and reading from what are arguably the most famous verses, in particular verses 5 and 6, the most famous Proverbs in in the book of Proverbs. Let us hear uh, these words of wisdom. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. And amen to this reading, God's reliable word. Now we're not aware of any birthday blessings of our primary age kids this week coming in. Are there any that we've missed? good. I think we're, our records are pretty almost complete. I know there might be some gaps yet, so we always want to check just in case. So boys and girls, ready to come down to the front, and I'll join you. Now, I know this is a bank holiday weekend. I know there's be already, there will certainly, there are families away in that. So it's lovely to see you, to see you in church this morning. Now, I wonder how many of you, I probably know the answer to this, knowing your homes, but how many have you have a dog? I don't think I know, I see any dogs in your homes, no. So um, we have got a dog uh, at home, and uh, it's a type of dog that's on the screen here. What kind of dog, breed of dog is that? Oh, there it's back again. Can you, do you know? A golden not sure. Um, everybody, or grown-ups to help, what kind of dog's that? 
golden retriever. And that's a much better, more useful <laughs> golden retriever than we probably have at home. Ours is just good at getting lost and uh, barking at people that shouldn't be barking at. Um, but this is a golden retriever. But it's not just a golden retriever. This job, this dog has got a very special job. Can you guess what it might be from the picture? You think of it, dogs that have a very special job helping people. Any ideas? What, Chloe? Perfect. The dogs that help people who can't see very well, and they, they lead them and guide them where they're going. Perfect. It's a guide dog, so guides people who can't see. And uh, today I want to tell you a wee story about a guide dog and, and his master. One day, this lady, who was partially sighted, couldn't see, in fact, she must have been completely blind when they hear the story, she was out walking along the pavement, along the same journey that she made most days with her guide dog. But on this particular day, her guide dog, as they were walking along, and she could kind of sense where she was, and so she knew where she, roughly her path, and the dog, her guide dog, all of a sudden pressed in against her leg, which was the symbol for, the sign for, either, you know, to, to turn, needed to, she needed to turn or stop. And did she? No, because she thought, I know this part of the path. No, the, the dog must have gone that wrong. Um, and she on, she kept going. But a little short distance further, her dog pressed in against her leg again, trying to tell her something, trying to tell her to turn or stop. And did she listen? No. And on she began to nearly force the dog a wee bit along and began to get a little cross with her dog. The dog leaned into her leg one more time and the woman got really cross. And she did something. She used to never do to a dog. She gave it a kick, a flick with her foot. And you know what she did? She marched on, ignoring her guide dog, straight into a car, a parked car. A car someone you see had driven into a driveway that crossed the pavement. And that wouldn't normally have been there. And she thought, there's never anything in my way. But the dog knew there was something in her way. The dog could see the car. And the dog was there to stop her harming herself, harming herself by walking into things like that. But she ignored her own loyal, trustworthy dog. She had no cause or reason to doubt him. But on this occasion, she thought she knew better. And she was, was the dog, was, was she right or wrong? Wrong because she walked into the car. And the minute she hit the car, thankfully she didn't injure herself too badly, she fell to her knees and wrapped her arms around her dog, so sorry for having been cruel to her good dog, because he was, her dog was a good dog and had only been wanting to spare her uh, what happened to her. And so she sobbed and was all very sorry uh, for what she did to her dog. Now I tell you that story, boys and girls, because we need guidance too. We are all partially sighted. Not that our eyes don't work, but and that we, we, can't, we can't make good choices in life. Um, we don't have enough knowledge uh, unless we have some guidance. We need some guidance. And God has given us very special guidance, clear guidance. Can you think of where or how God has guided us? I'll give you, give you a clue. What has God given us to be our guide? Yes? Have you always said that too? The Bible. He's given us his word, the Bible, in which he tells that reveals to us his will and warns us about all the problems in our hearts and that, that cause us to be unreliable in the choices we make. And he's also given, gives his people, those who have received Jesus, his Holy Spirit, who also guides us, who, who makes through our conscience, tells us whenever something's not right, when we should stop, um, just stop what we're doing or pause and, and seek uh, further guidance. And God has given us all this wonderful guidance through his word and by his Holy Spirit, but do we always listen to that guidance? Do you think that we always listen? No, we don't. Our problem is that even sometimes when we know what God says we should do, we still go ahead. Like that woman marching on, even though the, her dog was nudging her leg, said, stop, stop. 
Sometimes we're like that, and we just march on, determined to do our own thing, because we think we know better than God who made us, but it always ends in tears. And slam comes the consequences of for what we did wrong. But here's some good news, though, boys and girls. That is all true, and we mess up, and we should listen to God's Word, the Bible. And we should learn what His will for our lives is and everything. But we all mess up. We all make poor choices at times and do the wrong thing. And the good news is that does God hate us whenever we do that? No, He still loves us. And he wants for us to say sorry to him. And so the first thing we should do, just like that woman, whenever the woman realized she had done the wrong thing, do you remember what she did? She fell to the ground and gave her dog a hug and was so sorry. Well, we should, it's a good idea to fall to our knees and say sorry to God in prayer for the things we've done wrong and to know that he's ready to forgive us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I don't have a clicker. If we could click onto the next slide. Here's the verse that we've just read a minute ago. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lay not in your own understanding to ask God for guidance in everything and ask him to, to reveal his will to you through his word and by his Holy Spirit and he will guide us. And let's say sorry for the times whenever we don't, whenever we know what his will is, but we still don't do it. Can we pray with you now a wee minute to that end? So Father God, we thank you for the guidance you've given us by your word and by your Holy Spirit. And you've sent Jesus Christ to be uh, the way and the truth and the life and the one who would guide us one day to heaven. And we pray that for forgiveness though, whenever we ignore you, whenever we don't listen, we go on our own way. Um, forgive us for those times. And Lord, will you give us hearts that are tender and sensitive to your will and to your word, are revealed in your word. And this we all ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to sing together, Christ be my leader by night as by day. get you your packs um, for today. So do you want to come all over here and we'll get you your, your worksheets? First of all, if you want to take those. There you go, Chloe. Go Carson. Now, is it Oliver or Logan or Logan and Oliver? <laughs> Oliver. Oh, here, I'll give it to Andy Logan's hands first. I still haven't figured you boys out which way around you are, but here... There you go. And here, boys and girls, your packs for felt tips as well. Now, you forgive us, they're all a bit higgledy-piggledy, but uh, still should be what you need inside each of those. There you go. Is that all sorted? Anybody else that hasn't come up? Fear, want we?
Any others that I'm missing? There you go, Theo. Do you want one, Jacob? You okay? Now, so let's bring our uh, attention to some announcements. So this afternoon, my fine is down there. I can walk around and talk because I've got the radio mic on. Uh, so this afternoon, we have the, the out, one-to-one outreach down in Gosford. Um, um, it's obviously St. Patrick's Day. There's a lot of people in, uh, in enjoying a holiday weekend. And it's an opportunity for us to be able to, uh, to give out a wee tract uh, relevant to St. Patrick's Day and uh, to get to know who, who's there and just to chat with people and see what opportunities the Lord might give us uh, to share Jesus. And if you're up for that, uh, I'll be down there from four o'clock. Uh, drop me a wee message in case it's, I don't see you to give you the tracks for that. And if you're interested in that, uh, so just give us a wee text or say to me on the way out the door and I'll see you down there about four, or at four o'clock. Then this evening, as I get my breath back, uh, YF, uh, the last YF of the year. So, uh, so it's the last opportunity for this particular year for our young people to enjoy their time together Sunday evenings tonight, six o'clock. This Wednesday, um, Bright R meets at uh, 2.30, and the speaker is the Reverend Brian Colvin on the subject of reasons to love Jesus. Uh, this Thursday, all members of Congregational Committee are, are alerted that their meeting, scheduled meeting, is this Thursday night, 8 o'clock. And note that it's in the small memorial hall, because uh, there's someone else who's using the lecture hall. Um, I, the PW, say somebody else. It's the PW, uh, their meeting as well, 8 o'clock to to draw attention to that, to appreciate that will be a, those some that are, um, are going to be ta- drawn between the two of those. Um, but those are, and when I say though to the Congregational Committee meeting, that's an important meeting. They all are, but this is in particular um, to encourage as full an attendance as possible. Jumping down to Saturday, it's our church family meal. It's been on the, the sheets for months, uh, to uh, keep your date kind of an announcement, and now it's finally arrived. The cost is £12 per head, for adults, it's free for all who are under 18. The menu choice forms, there's hard copies out in the porch, and there's also the online form. If you've been on there, I know quite a few have already um, submitted their menu choices there. And we really encourage you to come along. And just enjoy a very simple meal together uh, and a chat. So uh, I look forward to seeing a good number there. It was a great night last time, and looking forward to this year's um, dinner. There are loads of other announcements. One that I do need to, um, it's important that I bring your attention to, it's in the back of the sheets, and that is regarding um, the update of our voters list. We have been granted permission by Neri Presbytery to proceed with an election of up to four, to, of up to four elders. Now that'll not be happening until after Easter, God willing, um, but in the meantime, we need to update our voters list. And, uh, and so this is the announcement that's saying it's going to be published next week and the following Sunday, and during that intervening week, there'll be an opportunity to, um, to submit any objections. You know, if there's maybe you feel a name is on there or a name's missing that you think should be on there, uh, you can raise that objection with myself in writing, and then session look at those objections and see if they need to make a correction to the voters list. And the qualifications for those who are on the list are that they are communicants on the role of the congregation and, uh, and have contributed to the stipend or weekly free will offering of the congregation in the, the last financial year. And we have also included those who have contributed in 2024 who've just got started um, in that list as well. So that, look out for that next Sunday and the following Sunday. Now there's loads of other announcements on there. Do uh, take the time to view them online or in, on the page and let us come, oh, I was going to say let us come to the Lord in prayer. There's one other announcement. Um, it's not on the sheets. Uh, and that is regarding sad events that unfolded this week. Um, it is with deep sadness that we announce the death of Mr. Richard Shaw, who passed away peacefully on Tuesday night in the hospice. And we want to express our heartfelt sympathies uh, to his wife Donna and their family, Karen, Alan, Neil, and Carrie, and to Richard's sister Joyce as well, and the whole family circle who have, who have just been... Um, so um, impacted um, by this, this, this death, um, as the whole community has been a young man uh, by all accounts. A service of thanksgiving for Richard's life took place on Friday 
in the lower meeting house. I'm going to thank the ladies who provided the tea for all who came. It was a massive uh, congregation formed uh, on Friday. And we thank the ladies for, for, for providing the refreshments and serving those, and those who served in the door as well. And we certainly commend the whole Shaw family to your prayers. And it's a very sad time uh, that we would lift them all up in our prayers and through our visits and support going forward as well. There was also news that uh, came through this week. If you're familiar with the work of Christ, the Christian Institute, and um, you will probably already know uh, through the emails they send out that their director, Colin Hart, died suddenly and unexpectedly on Wednesday of a suspected heart attack. And so we want to remember the Hart family and, and the, the Christian Institute um, as they um, take in this, this sad and sudden news. Um, we're going to remember them too in our prayers. So let's come now to the throne of grace. Uh, let's pray. Our Father God, we bow in your presence and acknowledge your sovereignty in death as in life today. And we are so glad for the hope that we have in the gospel and in Jesus' words when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. We thank you that through trusting in him, we have victory over the grave and that for all who are in Christ, there is the hope of the wonderful reunion to come. But Lord, in the meantime, it is so very difficult for families as they miss their loved ones, as they adjust to their absence. And we ask, Lord, pardon me, uh, we ask, Lord, that you be with the family of the late Colin Hart, uh, that they may be comforted this morning. And we pray for the family of the late Richard Shaw, Lord, that, that from our own congregation, that you would support um, Donna and the family. Um, at this very um, difficult time to endure. <coughs> Pardon me. Help them not to grieve as others do who do not have a hope, but to believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And Lord, help us to draw near to those who have been bereaved in recent times with compassion and understanding. Lord, in practical ways to be there for them and in prayer much too. And we pray for the ongoing work of the Christian Institute in particular, that you'll help the team as they, as they miss their colleague and director and brother, and Lord, as they seek in due course to recruit for that role, may you guide them in the days that lie ahead, as they would bring attention to the vital campaigns um, against the onslaught of secularism in our land. Um, Lord, bless their work, cause it to continue to flourish. And we pray for them as they mourn today. And Father, we want to thank you for this new partnership that now has officially begun between um, the congregations of Claddymore and Market Hill. We receive this as a wonderful providence from you, and Lord, may it bear much fruit uh, for your glory. And we pray, Lord, for the congregation of Tassa that has been parted from Claddymore and for its new partner in First Armagh, not far from us, that you would fill their vacancy quickly. And indeed, for all the vacant congregations in our denomination and in our sister churches in the Church of Ireland, Church of Ireland and, the, and all around us, Lord, we pray that you would raise up a new generation of servants to lead and also to take part in every aspect of the mission of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we do pray for those uh, amongst us who are sheep farmers and the sheep farmers, Lord, and our congregation as they continue in a very tiring time of year uh, where there's many ups and downs. Uh, may they get all the support they need with uh, times of exhaustion as they lamb their, their yews. And we pray, Lord, for those in particular who may not have a whole lot of help, uh, Lord, that you would, you would help them, Lord, to be able to endure. And for those who may be low in spirit, those who may be battling with mental ill health, Lord, give them hope and strength and bring healing, Lord, and resilience to their heart and mind. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing. My voice obviously needs to harden up a wee bit. It's been a long time since I've been taking two services back to back, and, my, and it takes me a while for the throat to harden, plus uh, resisting a cold. So uh, if my voice does give up today, you may get a shorter service. It's one positive might come out of it. Uh, let us, though, as I rest my throat, uh, come and sing, Focus My Eyes on You, O Lord.
and let us pray. Lord God, we ask now that the words of your servant's mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, our Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here we are at the beginning of a, a new partnership. Here we are at the beginning of a new language. I know for here in Margaret Hill, this, it may not seem like a whole lot's going to change, but, uh, but we do have a new partnership, and it's going to mean a redistribution of, of salmonized time uh, across two congregations. And I think I've asked before, and I, I do reiterate, uh, our request for your patience and understanding, if we are just not as available or, or as good at getting around um, as perhaps we could or sh should be um, until things bed in uh, and we get used to uh, the new arrangements. Now, whenever the patriarch Abraham, when he arrived at a new place, a new scene, the very first thing he did was to build an altar and to call upon the name of the Lord there. That was um, the, how he... He registered um, that he needed God's direction and how he acknowledged God in all his ways and was seek, how he sought God to make his paths straight in an unfamiliar place. And so as we find ourselves in a new uh, arrangement, as we feel our way, we, we very much need to do a similar thing. We need to call upon the name of the Lord. We need to pause and seek his face in prayer and seek his guidance um, right from the start. Does God still guide in personal ways in the way that uh, as Abraham was guided? Well, he does. Not that we, we have the, the theophanies and the occasions when God became present and spoke with Abraham face to face. Not that we have that. Um, because now we, of course, have the Bible, the Word of God, the complete canon of Scripture. And God speaks to us now through that. And by his Holy Spirit, of course, too. And one a Victorian era preacher, Joseph Parker, who was a congregational minister, um, he said, If the devil can tempt, why cannot God inspire, suggest, and direct? And so we can be confident that God will direct us in personal and, and ways that are specific to us in our work here in Market Hill with Claddymore. Indeed, God does direct us, and we depend on him to direct us. And we love these words from Psalm 32, which say, I will, God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. It's wonderful that God promises to, to do this. And today we're looking at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which show us how to be open to this counsel of the Lord Show us how to position yourselves to, to benefit most from that counsel. And the first title you might put upon verse 5 is, Lean on the Lord. It's what we've been called to do, to lean on the Lord. We read, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Now you'll see there's two verbs, two verbs uh, in this verse. I always doubt myself whenever you say that. You can look and see there's a third, but there's two verbs. And they are trust and lean. Now, the, word, the verb trust, the, the Hebrew word verb for trust here, actually means to lean. Uh, it means to physically lean upon something for support, like on a stick, uh, like in the picture. And it also can mean to rely upon someone or something for help or protection or security as well, to lean on someone for those, those vital needs. And so we are encouraged here to lean on the Lord for our support, for our help, for our protection, for everything really. We're to trust in the Lord. We're to let him take our weight. With this confidence, he's able to take your weight. He's able to take the weight of your soul and all its needs. And for that, we can, for that we can be certain. So we're to draw our sense of security, our sense of safety, from this, not from our own ingenuity, not from our own preparations and plans, not from the friends that we have or the money that we have, we're to draw that ultimately from God himself. Now, often in the Bible we have descriptions of when a people or a nation failed to do this and lived to suffer the consequences, uh, the, the, the consequences of not trusting first in the Lord. For example, in the history of Israel, Time and time again, they 
trust it in a foreign army to fight their battles instead of trusting in the God who had led them up out of Egypt with a mighty hand and through the wilderness and into the promised land despite the strength and might of the nations who were before them. Despite that history they had with God, they still were tempted to trust in foreign nations. One in particular who was like the America of the day, had the -the state-of-the-art, most sophisticated army replete with all their chariots, was Egypt. They often trusted in Egypt, paid money and went into treaties to supply this or that in order to have their protection. But the Lord addressed Egypt in the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 29, and he said this to Egypt. He said, you have been a staff of need, of reed. In other words, not a strong staff, a staff of reed for the house of Israel. When they grasped you with their hands, you splintered and you tore open their shoulders. When they leaned on you, you broke and their backs were wrenched. They made, so God's people made a terrible mistake trusting in Egypt. The only reed, the only staff, sorry, that will not let you down to lean on is, is the Lord himself. In other points in Israel's history, they provide a marvelous example of what we should do whenever we face uh, impossible odds, some terrible situation that completely uh, takes us way beyond our, our parameters for coping with things. One example of when the a king in Judah was a powerful example for us was King Asa, whenever they were facing the, the vast army uh, of Zerah, the, the Cushite, in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 14. And in that moment, they didn't go looking for some foreign power to come quickly to help them. Instead, King Asa made this prayer. Listen to this for a prayer of relying on the Lord, of trusting in the Lord with all your heart. He said this, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rely on you. And in your name we have come against this vast army. O Lord, you are God. Magnificent words of utter faith and trust in the Lord. And that's what this wee proverb encourages us to do, to trust in the Lord with all your heart. And it also warns us not to lean on our own understanding. We are not to lean on our own understanding for at least two reasons. Number one, it's because we were, made to, we were made from the very beginning to be dependent on the Lord. We were made to live in close community and close fellowship with Him. We were made to learn to walk with Him and talk with Him and be guided by Him from day to day. But yet, we see that Adam and Eve, even in their pristine condition before the fall, couldn't make the right choice when it came to the temptation that was presented to them, the sense of push and rush that was put upon them to make a decision about the forbidden fruit. Even they, with their sinless nature, couldn't trust in that capacity and that perfect nature to make the right choice. And if that was true of them and their sinless condition, how much more do we then need, given that now we have a sinful nature by birth, Since the fall, we cannot trust our own understanding because it is warped. Our influence is skewed, our our understanding is skewed by the influence of our sinful nature and all the range of desires we have within us that are wrong. The RMS Taylor um, was a ship that has been described in history since as the first Titanic, which is the first clue as to the fate that it's going to that it faced. The RMS Taylor was a state-of-the-art boat sporting a nice new iron hull, which was a, an innovation for the day. And off it set, it was faster than ships usually were, and uh, it set sail from Liverpool on its maiden voyage to Australia. And off it set, and the crew on board believed they were eventually sailing south to Australia, except that they weren't. They were actually sailing directly west out of Liverpool towards the coast of Ireland. And a fog came down so that they couldn't check that they were going the right direction with the the contours of any landmass that they may have been approaching. And they thought the fog came down, so they trusted all the more in their compass on board. But the problem was their compass was faulty. 
But trusting in their faulty compass, they just plunged, plowed straight on and into Lambe Island, where, sadly, um, some 290 only survived out of a total passenger itinerary of 650. So over 300, maybe 360 people perished because the crew trusted the compass that was on board that was faulty. Why was it faulty? Well, it turned out the iron hull was warping the, the magnet within the compass, making it just keep going straight ahead. So they clearly um, were following the wrong instrument. That ship reminds me of how, we, how many start off life believing they have a clear head to make their own decisions about their future. To, they, they have enough knowledge, enough ability, enough gut instinct to keep them going the way they should go. But what we all forget is that we have this latent problem, this iron hull of a sinful nature that warps our judgment so that we do not go the way we should. Instead, we often if we're led by our own warped or uh, defective judgment, or worse still, by our own impulsive uh, desires, we end up plowing straight into a mess. We make shipwreck. Hence, we need this verse, the wisdom of this verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Only He is fully, infinitely competent to guide us, because he isn't skewed by a sinful nature. He has all knowledge and wisdom. He can see through the fog of life and the things that, that cloud our judgment. He can see right through it perfectly. So we need to learn, therefore, to trust in him, to trust in him, and lean not on our own understanding, because our nature is so warped. Draw our sense of security and safety from, from trusting in the Lord, with all your heart and in all, your, all that you do and in all your decisions. Verse 6 develops the thought a little further then. Verse 6 is, uh, we may entitle it, Paused to Pray. We read, In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. As Charles Bridges put it, Consider no circumstances too clear to need his direction. To consider no circumstances too clear to need his direction. In other words, there's no situation you can say, oh, I've got this. Sorry, God, I've got this one. And go on ahead. No, we, we should consult with the Lord every time. There's an illustration of whenever God's people didn't. Um, in Joshua chapter 9, in the story of the Gibeonites, whenever they came to deceive Joshua, and his men. Joshua and his army had been given the charge to clear the land of Canaan as an act of judgment upon the people because, in Canaan because they had perpetrated such horrendous crimes. You read some of them in Leviticus chapter 18, child, including child sacrifice and everything. It was, it was horrendous. And God, uh, Israel was God's instrument of justice and judgment in that time. I don't believe Israel have that role today, by the way, uh, to distinguish it from what's happening in Israel now. But in that time, they did. And as they were moving into the land, along came the Gibeonites. And they pretended to be a people from far, far away. In other words, not amongst the list of nations that were under judgment. And they came and they, they put on an act they had moldy food with them to make it look as if they'd been on the road a long time. And they had worn out sandals and dusty, worn out clothes. And so they made the case that they were from far, far away. And they asked if they might enter a peace treaty with Israel. Having heard about their God and all that he had done in bringing them up out of Egypt, they thought this would be a good treaty to enter. And that was the, the ruse that they, 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 they um, set before Joshua. And the stinging verse, the condemning verse in Joshua chapter 9 is this. The men of Israel sampled their provisions. You know, they were checking this. This, this bread does look very moldy. That must be weeks and weeks old. They sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. As a result of that, 
Joshua went on ahead and made a binding peace treaty with the Gibeonites, only to regret it three days later when they discovered they actually were nearby and were amongst those who were under judgment and were to be removed. And as a result of that treaty, they had to honor it. And as a result, the Gibeonites stayed in the land. Um, they were ultimately put to work and things, but they made a terrible mistake, Israel, by not inquiring of the Lord. Instead, you see, they trusted, they sampled their provisions, they trusted their five senses instead of trusting in God. They thought they, they had enough capacity to make this decision themselves, but, but really they didn't. And indeed, before we have, make any important decision, make any direction in life, we must pause to pray. Even at the start of this new language is what we're doing. We're not rushing off in a whole lot of different directions, saying we know what to do, we know what our priorities are. We're pausing to pray and to seek God's direction and leading. Luke tells us that Jesus, whenever he came up out of the Jordan, just baptized, and before he went out to his trials in the wilderness to be tempted with the devil, before he then began his ministry, before any of that started, Jesus, Luke tells us, as he came up out of the river, was praying, praying for guidance of the Holy Spirit for all that would go before him. We know also on the night before Jesus picked, selected, and appointed his 12 disciples, what was Jesus doing that night? He was praying. He spent the whole night in prayer, in fact, before that decision because it was so important. So Jesus gives us this powerful example of how before anything starts, we must pray. And let him, therefore, by his Spirit and by his Word, um, direct us to our priorities and what we're to do first. How much more do we need to pray than Jesus, given that we do not have all knowledge as he had, and given that we are so susceptible to deception and deceivers like Gibeonites. I mean, today, scammers are everywhere. And the thing that a scammer always tries to do is, is to hurry up to make a decision quickly. You have to make this decision now. We need this now. Do you see when someone presses you for a decision that has to be now? That's an immediate red flag to stop. Say, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm not making any decision about this now. Um, I need to take some time. And what you need to do is, is pray and pray for wisdom. Of course, there's, if it's a, a lot of scammers, just put the phone down, delete that text, whatever. But we, need, we are safeguarded against scams, deceivers, whenever we pause to pray. It's the safest thing you could do. There's no guarantee, of course, that that as we pray and we do pray for things that we still don't make missteps, we still don't in the moment make a wrong decision, but, but we can have this confidence that if we are generally in the attitude of prayer by everything, that the Lord can even tend our mistakes and bring them around and forgive us certainly and even work our mistakes out into, in ways that ultimately will tend towards our good. So, in all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. These words point us to a more subtle problem, though, than our propensity to be hoodwinked, you know, our vulnerability or sometimes our gullibility. What these words point us to here is that in all our ways, we're to acknowledge the Lord. And this word acknowledge, it means to know someone, it means to recognize someone, to, to give them their place. And what we're doing when we pause to pray is, is we're we're acknowledging the Lord's lordship over our lives, that His authority over every aspect of our lives, and that we are to submit ourselves to His will. And what we're doing when we pause to pray is saying, Lord, if you want me to go left, I'll go left. If you want me to go right, I'll go right. If you want me to go forward, go back. Just tell me. <laughs> Guide me. You see, our problem is usually not always that that we don't know what the Lord's will is. Our problem is more often than not that we know what the Lord's will is, but we don't want to do it. We've already made our own mind up, and we come to God in prayer, perhaps, but only in the hope that He'll endorse it, that He'll rubber stamp it, that He'll sign it off to let us go ahead and do what we want 
what we want ourselves. There's a rather shocking example of God's people doing exactly that in Jeremiah 42. It's a story of what happened immediately after the city of Jerusalem was flattened by Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar left a wee pocket of people, the poorest of the poor in the land, just to stop it from becoming completely overrun with wild animals and stuff. And that wee group of people asked Jeremiah to consult with the Lord and to ask the Lord what they should do. Pray, they asked that the Lord would tell them what they should do, where they should go. And they made an oath saying, whatever the Lord says, we will do. So off Jeremiah went sought the Lord. Ten days later, Jeremiah comes back with a word from the Lord saying, stay where you are. If you stay where you are, I will bless you. And the Lord, knowing their hearts already though, added to that message this line, and do not go to Egypt. What did the people do? They went to Egypt. How could they do that after having promised they would do exactly what the Lord said? Because they already had made up their mind what they wanted to do. They wanted to go to Egypt. They just wanted God to endorse their willful decision. There's great danger when we come to God with that attitude, without that humility and sensitivity and openness to the will of God. There is great danger. But you know this, friends, the truth is the Bible tells us that we all have that nature. We are told in Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. We all have this problem of a willful nature uh, that doesn't want to do God's, God's will. So what hope is there for us? Here we've been told to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not in our own understanding. Acknowledge the Lord in all our ways and to, he'll make our paths straight. Here's this wonderful proverb, but the reality is none of us complete it. None of us can, can carry that through on everything. We all fail miserably. What hope is there for us then of enjoying the blessings that we're told will follow those who do do these things? And um, we read in here of prolonged life, we of love God's love and faithfulness never leaving us, and, and of favor and a good name in the sight of God. Man, what hope is there for us ever, therefore, having those blessings? Well, friends, our hope is not in us getting better and better at our obedience. Our hope is in one man who has fulfilled this proverb perfectly, who did trust in God as Father emphatically and leaned upon him for everything, and who did acknowledge his heavenly Father in all his ways. And that is, of course, our Lord Jesus. And because he has fulfilled the law and fulfilled all of this perfectly, he is the one who has earned this wonderful blessing and is the one who will bring us into that blessing now through trusting in him. It's through turning to Jesus, through trusting in him. That's the very first um, way that we should acknowledge the Lord is that we need him and of the salvation that only he can wrought for us. We need to lean on him for salvation, for only he can save our souls. And through trusting in him, we come into this blessing. We are to confess every occasion where we have turned our, to our own way and trust in Jesus to wash away the guilt and the shame of all that sad personal history, to wash it all away with the blood that he shed in Calvary for you and for me. And what a wonderful washing he can perform. It doesn't matter what has happened before today. Just draw a line under it. And he is able to wash away all the guilt and sin and shame and failure and punishment and for that. And place your hope in him. Trust in him to receive all these blessings. And then let him teach you, teach us all to lean on the Lord. There's those blessings that we acquire in him. Lean on the Lord and pause to pray. Now on Tuesday night, God willing, the Kirk Sessions of Margaret Hill and Claddy Moore will be meeting uh, at the manse. And we'll certainly be praying. We'll certainly be just getting to know each other. But, but also we're, we're meeting to establish God, what God's priorities for us would be at this time, to discern his leading and guiding. There's a lot of practical things to sort out, like um, 
configuration of midweek, configuration of evening services, configuration of communion seasons, all kinds of things like that. But we don't want to do anything. We don't want to even suggest a thing without first pausing to pray. And we ask that as a congregation, you would also pray for the Kirk Sessions as they uh, meet to make these kinds of initial decisions and that God would guide our way as a new partnership forward for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That we may know what the Lord would have in store for us and that we would discover that while on our knees and by leaning on the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father God, we pray that you would make us each to know your ways. There's so many things in life that we need your help with. Decisions on, on the subjects we study, what colleges we apply for, what jobs we apply for, what person we may ask out on a date. Lord, there's so many things that we need to know your ways in. And we pray that you would teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation, and for you we wait. We wait all day long. Amen. Let's close our service as we sing our final hymn, Lord for the years, your love has kept and guided.
Now may the Lord make known to each one of us individually and as a congregation the way that we should go as we would lift up our souls to God and seek his direction. And may his good spirit lead us all on level ground. Amen.